You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 512. Hello and welcome once again to the Outdoor Station, the longest running podcast in the world dedicated to the adventurous lives of my many and varied guests, to self-powered travel and to a healthy appreciation of the world around us. I'm your host Bob Cartwright and since 2005 I've produced over 500 podcasts on this subject all of which are still available via the outdoorstation.co.uk website, your podcast streaming service, which could be Apple, Google, Spotify, and internet radio, smart TV, and of course, now smart speakers. In fact, the ways to listen are getting so rich and varied now, I've dedicated an entire page to it over on the Outdoor Station. Now, while you're there, maybe you might like to join my newsletter list and make a few suggestions yourself of further guests. Rest assured, I don't send many emails, but I will be updating my faithful supporters soon as the new offices and studio should be ready, all fingers crossed, by March. And I will have big news to follow. But I digress. My guest on this two-part interview is Nikki Ray, who, just before her 30th birthday, set off in August 2018 and cycled solo on a bike she had built herself out of spare parts from Santander in Spain to Ghana. A total of over 10,000 kilometres through 13 countries, which culminated in May 2019. She refers to her journey as ready, steady, slow, as she wasn't in a mad rush and wanted to absorb the joy of travelling by bike and the subtle changes in the landscape, the culture and the people as she cycled from Europe into Morocco, across the Sahara, through Sierra Leone to Ghana. Of course, there's more information over on the show notes on theoutdoorstation.co.uk. However, her blog is extremely well written and provides lots of detail and atmosphere. And it can be found at readysteadyslow.wordpress.com. I do hope you're enjoying these weekly podcasts and the variety in my rich and varied guests. If you can link to The Outdoor Station in your social media, it would really help with the motivation to keep producing each week. Now, Nikki, as you'll hear, had an epic trip, but her relationship with cycling only really developed in recent years. So actually, I had a bike as a child, but I stopped riding for quite a long time and only started again when I was about 22. I guess I'd like intermittently ridden a bike before Um, and the first thing I did on a bike was to ride for like a university charity cycle in the Indian Himalayas like on a mountain bike but supported so all of our stuff was in a van Um, so after that I got a bike Um, I did a bit of riding in the Scottish Highlands by myself in France by myself Um, and then in sort of a career change situation I trained to be a cycling instructor which is um, mostly teaching primary school children a course called bikeability during school time I also teach female refugees how to cycle with um, a project called the bike project in London and so because I was cycling all the time and I'd also enjoyed uh, traveling over land I'd done like various hikes and stuff as well I kind of got it in my head to to do longer cycles than I'd done because before it had been about maximum six weeks and I've been to Ghana quite a few times in the past and I have some very good friends there and I kind of started as a joke with my best friend Aisha that one day I would cycle to see her which she didn't obviously quite believe and so I started the trip without telling her because I wasn't sure how it was going to go and then I told her in about Morocco that I was indeed like cycling to go and see her so kind of yeah one thing one thing fell into another thing and then I ended up cycling to Ghana I guess. So just coming back slightly to the cycle teaching, maybe it's just a Western assumption, but I would have assumed that most people could ride a bicycle. So teaching refugees to cycle, is that actually quite difficult? I mean, not everybody in this country can ride a bicycle. So I 
I live in like a very urban area of South London where lots of children don't know how to ride a bicycle because either they live in a, a tower block and there's nowhere to keep a bicycle or their parents can't afford a bicycle or their parents don't know how to ride a bicycle. So actually, even in this, people that come from this country, not everybody can learn to ride a bicycle. But the course at school actually isn't teaching them how to ride, which we do manage to squeeze in sometimes. It's a course of how to build skills to then ride on the road and taking like 10 to 11 year olds on quiet roads and, and starting to teach them the rules of the road. With with female refugees, often, depending on which country they've come from, they've never had the opportunity to ride a bicycle either because of cultural taboos or just boys are cycling bicycles and women aren't. So like a large majority of the women that I teach, it's for the very first time that they're learning how to ride a bicycle, which I think is really wonderful. Um, at a beginner level, it doesn't really matter about language barriers or or lack of a common language necessarily, and especially because there's lots of people learning at the same time. You can you can learn a lot by like hand signals and watching by learning, but when you're trying to teach someone how to use gears without a common language, that's when it gets a little bit a little bit complicated. So yeah, it's been it's been an interesting um, learning experience to try and and teach a skill without using that many words. But it's but I really really enjoy it. I would have thought that it's actually very rewarding when the females that uh, obviously not had the cultural freedom, as it were, to do that. They must be quite excited by the whole process. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, lots of people, when they arrive on their first day, like they have their phone out straight away doing a little photo shoot with the bike. And yeah, everyone's always really excited to either to return to cycling. Maybe they haven't cycled since they were a child or to do it for the very first time. Fantastic. Anyway, let's move on to your big adventure, your big trip, which, as we've already mentioned in the introduction, the website is readysteadyslow.wordpress.com. And it's a very interesting blog that uh, that takes you on your trip. Now, the actual trip was August 2018 to May 2019, but the blog starts a bit later in the actual trip. So would you just like to give an overview of what the trip was, sort of a generalisation from start to finish, and then we'll start dipping into parts of it? Yeah, so basically I decided to start in Spain for different reasons. So I got a ferry from Plymouth to Santander and I started cycling from there. And I joined a group of people that I had kind of organised, been involved in organising a small bike tour with. And they were they were going across the north of Spain and down into Portugal. So that's kind of why I decided to start there and do this trip in, in general because of the timing. So I cycled along the top of Spain, down through Portugal and back into Spain, where I got a ferry to Morocco. Um, And I went through Morocco in kind of a zigzag fashion. I when I was arriving in Morocco, actually, I was like, oh, goodness me, I actually don't know where I'm going to go because it's such a huge country. And I felt a bit overwhelmed, like trying to plan where I'd go. I knew I didn't want to go along the coast because then you'd be missing out on all the mountains. And I really love mountains. So I kind of took it week by week and wiggled through. I ended up going to Marrakesh, actually, which I hadn't planned to. But there I visited um, Well, I chose to go there because I found out about this bike project, which kind of does a similar thing to the one I work for in London. So they're called Pakala and yeah, it's a, a social bike project in Marrakesh that teaches local people how to be mechanics. They have um, women and men as well that are tour guides. So they go on bicycle tours around around the city. Um, so I went, really wanted to visit them. So I did. And then I went over the high Atlas Mountains and then I wasn't sure I was going to go. And I met some other cycle tourists that said they'd been over the anti Atlas Mountains. And it was really a wonderful experience because the rock formations are different to the high Atlas Mountains. So I went over the anti Atlas Mountains and then it was starting to get towards the desert. So then I cycled through the desert, through the rest of Morocco and then through Western Sahara and then through Mauritania. Um, in Mauritania, I decided to take this iron ore train because it's the longest train in the world. Um, it's about two kilometres or miles, like a very long train that's car- carrying iron ore from inland to the coast. So I took it when it was empty from the coast inland um, and put my bike and all my stuff on as well. That was quite an experience that you can read about in my blog. And then I carried on to the capital of Mauritania and then it was starting to get kind of tropical sub-Saharan, but still quite arid. So below Mauritania is Senegal. I spent quite a lot of time in Senegal because I had a a road accident, not a particularly bad one, but I fell and really hurt my knee. 
So I had to stop cycling for about a month. So yes, that was spent in Senegal, but then I went through Gambia. Uh, Gambia is surrounded by Senegal, so I went through Senegal again. And then there's lots of tiny little countries in West Africa, so I'll try and remember them in the right order. Afterwards is um, Guinea-Bissau, where there's the second biggest carnival in the world that luckily I managed to, my trip managed to coincide with when that was happening. Then there's Guinea, which has the capital of Conakry. Then there's Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, and then finally Ghana. So especially in the last five countries, it was very humid, tropical heat. And I did discover that I was cycling in the hottest um, hottest months of the year, which was quite unfortunate because I was thinking, oh, God, am I getting ill? And I just realized, no, it's 40 degree heat with humidity. So, yeah, it was, it was quite tough. Well, I'm just looking at a map as you actually described the the route and reading your blog earlier on, I was trying to map some of the, some of the routes that you took and uh, it's uh, it's quite some area that you've actually covered. But I know that you said you were going to visit your friend in Ghana and that was presumably the main purpose of, of the actual trip. But was there any other reason at all? Was there a, ch- a charity reason or anything like that you were doing it? Oh, there was there was lots of different reasons. I just I say the friend reason because I just think it's quite funny that genuinely I did say to her I'd come and visit her one day and she just laughed at me. Um, but I guess yeah, for lots of different reasons. Like I really like traveling overland, especially when you're going a long distance because you really see how like the culture is changing. And it was quite interesting going from the south of Spain to the north of Morocco, and you could really see like it. There were still quite similar cultures, and then going through Morocco, it changes. And between uh, West African countries as well, there were lots of similarities, but also some differences of like the food that was eaten, whether people were riding bicycles, lots of different things. Also, I guess kind of as a challenge, like because I'm interested in the subject, I know that there's lots of female solo cycle tourers going around the world that have done this route before, etc. But there's not that many. And when I say that to people, they say, but the thing is, like, nobody has heard of them. Nobody knows that people people are doing this so I kind of wanted to do it as a challenge and to prove like the world isn't this big dangerous place that everybody makes it out to be like I'm a woman I travel by myself um across the desert over the mountains uh, through countries of different religions and like I was fine and I had a very good time and I met very very generous people like in every single country that I went through uh, I guess another maybe final part was when I, I went to university and I studied African studies and it was specifically West African studies focused. So I'd already traveled to a few countries in that area. But by doing this trip, I've basically visited most of the countries in, in West Africa. Um, so that was another good reason to to travel by bicycle, be able to do it slowly and really kind of take in the countries where if you travel by like public transport or by a car, then you're you're going relatively quickly because a lot of the countries, even though I was going slowly, I, I was in and out of them within like 10 days or two weeks, which I spent two months in Morocco. So I felt like I really got to know Morocco and some of the smaller countries I didn't. So, yeah, that's another another reason for traveling by bicycle, traveling a bit more slowly, getting to meet more people along the way. And I'm, I presume visiting the country has certainly put the atmosphere and added the atmosphere to all the studies that you'd been doing when you've been looking at those countries. Although the, 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 I find the, the amusing part of the story, and it's sort of tongue-in-cheek really, but the amusing part of the story is that having cycled all the way to Ghana, your friend wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I hadn't seen her for quite a few years. And since I last saw her, she changed her job and she now has like a quite important uh, role. So I think she's the... I, I may be wrong and she can misquote me but I think she's the director of West Africa for an agribusiness company so she is traveling all the time so she was actually in Mali when I arrived Um, and I stayed with her brother who I've met but I hadn't actually seen him since he was about uh, 16 or 15 so he'd obviously changed quite a lot that was about 10 years before or something but yeah so I waited around for her for about 10 days but it was a little bit of a diff I could just imagine like cycling through Accra the capital of Ghana and then arriving at her house that I had visited before and it'd be all dramatic but yeah she wasn't there but but things don't always go exactly to plan like it was nice when she finally did arrive. <laughs> A lot of this conversation I want to have with you, really, I mean, there's so much to talk about as regards individual countries and some of the experiences, as I say, which we'll sort of dip into from things that I've read in the blog. But really, it's more a case of stepping back and actually looking at this journey as a whole 
And did you find that you started the journey when you arrived, presumably at Bilbao in Spain? Did you find that you were sort of apprehensive and nervous about what was going to be facing you, but not so much Spain, but perhaps Morocco as you started to get into Africa? Yeah, so I think I knew that I wanted to arrive in Ghana, but I didn't want to think about arriving just in case I didn't because it meant so much to me to arrive. So I was kind of thinking like country by country, especially in the beginning, because it was such a huge like thing to think about. I did get nervous before I went to Morocco, because as I said before, it's such a huge country and I hadn't really made a plan of where I was going to go. But then once I arrived in Morocco and I realised, oh my goodness, I think it's the easiest place to cycle tour, potentially in the whole world, not that I've cycled in every country in the world, but people are just so generous and what um, after staying with a girl in the city of Meknes on couch surfing, she was a student and she was saying to me, I guess for like for her and my peace of mind, she was like, please, can you always try and stay with people? And she had done quite a lot of hitchhiking around the country. So she said, yeah, just knock on somebody's door and ask, can you camp next to their house at least? And she said, to be honest, I think they will invite you inside, but just ask. So after the first, I guess, five times when a woman always opened the door and they always there was only one time where they were like, I'm not sure about this character, which I totally, totally understand. It's quite random to turn up on someone's land and be like, hello, I'm a cyclist. Can I camp here? Um, but yeah, all of the times a woman would open, they'd invite me inside. They'd have somewhere for me to sleep, often in the kind of living room, hospitality room of the house. Um, they'd give me tea, they'd feed me food. Like So once I knew how it was going to play out, um, I felt like extremely comfortable. Sometimes I did put my tent next to somebody's house. Um, but just, yeah, knowing the reception that I was most likely going to receive. But then obviously with each new country that you go into, especially in the the smaller West African countries, like every single one has a different currency. So you're having to work out how to get the new currency, trying to work out a conversion and like how much things should cost. And one country that I really had difficulties with, I, I crossed quite, well, no, quite a, an extremely small border between Guinea-Bissau and Guinea-Conakry. I actually didn't get stamped out of Guinea-Bissau, which in the end didn't matter. But I didn't get stamped in electronically into Guinea. So when I tried to leave, that was a little bit problematic, but fine. But anyway, so I cycled for like 100 kilometers on unpaved roads, broke a spoke. That was another situation. But I get to a town and I'm trying all of the ATMs and none of them work. And in other countries, there's either no money in the ATMs or there's no power. That happens in Sierra Leone. So then people are sending me here, there and everywhere trying to find a money changer. And in the end, someone's like, just go to the market. And then I found a money changer because even in the banks, I had the currency of the of Guinea-Bissau, but they they wouldn't change that currency. So, yeah, so I was like, how am I going to find money in this country? But luckily I found like a quote unquote black market money money dealer and ended up being able to change all my money up. You're listening to The Outdoor Station. Award-winning producers of podcasts to inform, inspire, entertain and encourage people to enjoy a healthy outdoors lifestyle. You were doing this obviously on a budget, which you presumably had saved up beforehand. How much were you working on initially per day, as, as I mean, including Europe, including Spain and Portugal? And how much actually ultimately did it cost you? Yeah, so I, I figured before I went that I should make some kind of rough plan, but I, I intended on doing it kind of as, as cheaply as possible. So I just did a random amount of like £10 a day, which maybe in the end, on average, I did. But some days, especially in Morocco, I maybe spelt, spent like 50p or something crazy. On other days, like when I was paying for a really expensive visa, so I think the most expensive one was for Liberia, it was like $130 or something. So it really fluctuated depending on the day. I didn't really pay for much accommodation because if I was in a city, staying in a city, I would try and plan ahead to stay with somebody from couch surfing or the cycling equivalent, warm showers, which there were some, but it wasn't in every country. Um, and in, yeah, in the end in Ghana, I stayed in like quite a few guest houses because I'd asked to stay with the chief and they'd say, well, we have a guest house. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll I'll stay in the guest house. So I actually can't tell you how much money I spent because I'd sort of accidentally accumulated money from, even though I live in London, I, I don't spend very much money because I don't pay for transport because I cycle everywhere. And um, 
I live in a house where we we share all of the food, so which keeps costs down. So maybe I don't know, maybe three thousand pounds or something. I'm 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 really not sure because basically I came back home and I still had money in my bank account, which was really exciting. Because <laughs> um, I also didn't know how long it was going to take either. Um, so yeah, so I made this like general budget of include basically the main cost was visas, and then I ended up flying back, which I didn't really want to, but yeah, overland would have been really complicated. So um, so yes, yeah, so basically the flight and the visas were the main things, and then taking into account like if I did stay somewhere and food and maybe visiting like tourist attractions and stuff. So let's say three thousand pounds. I don't know if that's true. It seems like it was um, a magical time in your life that enabled you to say that this is going to be a a slow pace, no rush. It doesn't matter what time I get there. I've got nothing I need to be back for. It's a very unique moment in your life to, to do this, don't you think? Yeah, well, I guess the, the thing is that when I decided I was going to do this trip, that was uh, it, that it was exactly as you describe it. But I... I met my girlfriend before I went on the trip. So then it kind of, everything kind of changed along the way. Like I was still keeping the slow mentality, but towards the end I was like, okay, I'd quite like to to return back. But yeah, I didn't know the kind of what situation I would come back to London to. And actually before I went, people kept talking about me coming back to London. I was like, oh, but I don't know if I necessarily will come back. I don't know, it was, yeah, kind of, things kind of changed along the way. But when I did come back, I did realise that I had given away some of my stuff that I'd forgotten about. And I was like, oh, where's that thing? Oh, no, I gave that away because I didn't think I'd need to use it. And now I'm back and need to use it. But I guess another way of answering your question is um, because my work is freelance, it allowed me to say, OK, now's the moment. Like I have enough money and I can just kind of pause my work and... I didn't know. I mean, I knew that when I came back, I probably would be able to find some work, but nothing was really certain. But kind of I felt like I was really challenging myself in that sense of, okay, I'm just going to leave. I'm going to give up my room in in the house I was living in and just go off and see what happens. It's a journey where I'm sure many people, the first things that they would think and say would be anything to do with safety. And, um, you know, we're bound to talk about this, as I'm sure you've done many times with people. And I know that Spain doesn't encourage wild camping. And you were doing this, as you say, on a a small budget. So uh, I trust where you couldn't get a couch surfing arrangement or or hot showers, you would you would wild camp. But you're heading from from Spain, um, from a fairly very busy city, obviously, down into Portugal, which presumably you kissed onto various um, coastal areas of that as well before moving down into Morocco. Now, I've done a fair amount of traveling myself many years ago, and I just wondered how long did it take you to open your heart to to accepting luck and trusting people on the road? That's a very good question. Um, I feel like my trip was kind of in two in two parts like the European bit and then the North and West African bit. And the European bit was slightly different because I was cycling with with a group of people and um, it was actually a very large group of people and we were going very slowly and we would wild camp as like a, a giant group of people. It's, it's quite amazing. But um, so I wasn't interacting with um, local people as the same way I did once I left that group in Portugal and went through Spain. It's funny because I didn't actually think, it didn't occur to me in Spain to knock on someone's door and ask if I could stay, but my perception of um, of people in Europe compared to people in Morocco is that maybe Europeans wouldn't wouldn't be as, as welcoming. I'd really actually like to try and do this in England, like in the countryside and see what reactions I get. But once it, I just got to Morocco and I'd realised how welcoming people were, I, yeah, I, I, I trusted people quite easily i i have traveled quite a lot before not by bicycle necessarily but in in different countries across the world so i i'd like to think i'm quite street savvy and kind of can assess situations which obviously helps but i think in in the uk well in london definitely people just don't trust each other maybe it's because it's a different situation but i yeah i found it i found it very easy to trust people and was overwhelmed and very pleasantly surprised by their generosity and and 
towards somebody who was potentially quite scary. There was a few occasions where people opened the door and they were scared of me. One lady in particular, I remember in Morocco, where I ended up making very good friends with her daughter, who ended up being able to speak like French, English and obviously Arabic. But her mum was really scared and she explained to me that she'd never had a foreign person in her house. So obviously, if, and also if you've never left your own country or never even left like the town or the region that you're from, it's understandable to be afraid of, of foreign people. But on the whole, most people were just like really fascinated and interested, which I thought was amazing. I um, took my teenage girls to uh, Morocco back in the 90s and we came into Tangiers and hitched and did various things on trains and w made our way down to, to Marrakesh. And the I was shocked at the time just how um, male-dominated the society was and literally I'd be walking behind them and, and my wife on the street and the men would be making all sorts of lewd comments and that type of thing. So as soon as... I hear of somebody like yourself that cycled through Morocco and particularly being on your own, I'm instantly thinking you might have faced very similar situations. But reading your blog, it seems like, uh, in fact, it was the opposite, if anything at all. Yeah, it was It was the complete opposite because all the things I'd, well, not all, but many things I'd heard about Morocco are similar to the story that you just told. And also from other female, like, backpacker travellers I met. So I'm wondering whether... This is a kind of city centric behavior of people. And I think across the world, it doesn't matter what country you're in, like cities are dangerous places and attract like not such nice characters. But in the countryside, people are kind of more kind and and generous, which is, I think, what, what I experienced. And I didn't really spend that much time in, in the city and in, um, in si different cities in Morocco or, or across the country. So possibly that's it. But. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to go to Marrakesh because I like I have blonde hair and I thought, wow, I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb. But even when I did go to Marrakesh, I actually didn't have that experience. So, yeah, it's really interesting how people can have very different experiences in the same country and how actually somebody's bad experiences can, can, could completely put somebody off visiting where possibly that wouldn't happen to them. Well, unfortunately, during the time that uh, you were away, obviously those uh, Scandinavian tourists were unfortunately murdered in the High Atlas Mountains, which, which obviously was completely unique to the uh, Morocco generally. And uh, I have a feeling I've interviewed somebody else uh, a, few, a few days ago, in fact, who also experienced Morocco. But they found that the gendarmes were... Uh, yes, they were very chauvinistic, but they were very chauvinistic in a very protective way. And it was, again, after this uh, particular sad episode. And so much so that they were con they were being continually um, not harassed, but protected by them and, and ushered off the trip that they were trying to do for their own safety in the, the local gendarme's eyes. And I wonder if you had similar situations with when you were uh, traveling through policed areas or if you met any official people. That's really interesting. I wonder whether was that in um, in okay. So, so I had that experience in in the desert parts of Morocco, and maybe I'll talk about that, and then I'll ask you about what that person spoke about. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a sinister time because I'd made lots of Moroccan friends, and I had their their contact details, and so it got to a point where everybody started messaging me and saying, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "This is bizarre. Why is everybody messaging at the same time?" and I realised afterwards that I had overheard people watching this horrible video of these two women being murdered, but I didn't understand. The first time I was just like, why is someone screaming? And then I realised people were seeing this video. Um, the thing is, with, with all terrorist attacks, it was like one crazy incident of somebody that had issues and did such a horrible thing. But it's ha similar, like, terrorist attacks have happened in this country and, and across the world. Um but in the desert, maybe it happens all the time. But yeah, surrounding that time, I had, it was actually a little bit unnerving because I had the gendarmerie following me, but I I had to take their word for it because they weren't in uniform. So they were in an unmarked car and they weren't wearing uniform, but they said, oh, I'm the, I'm the gendarmerie for this area. And they wouldn't actually say they were going to follow, but I saw them overtaking me and stopping and then I'd cycle past. And actually, I found it quite annoying. I understand they're trying to be protective, but the ironic thing is, 
that was a kind of relatively populated area of, of the desert. And then I crossed into Western Sahara. And then towards the end of Western Sahara, between Western Sahara and Mauritania, there was a huge stretch where there's there's no building for like 85 kilometers and there was no gendarmerie um, patrolling there. So I just thought it was really ironic, like, wait, this would be a great place <laughs> for something awful to happen and no one's even checking. Because sometimes they would they would say, oh, here's my number. You have to tell me where you're staying. And I would take the number and I wouldn't tell them where I was staying. And there was one gendarmerie who um, he said he arrived. I was sleeping at a cafe. Well, I was actually sleeping in the shed of a cafe. It was a bit bizarre. And he finally found me. And he said, oh, I've been looking for you for ages. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He was like, oh, well, you were faster than I expected you to be. And I was like, well, nobody told me that I needed to check in with you. Um, but he was quite an interesting source of information, actually. He told me about, yeah, I asked him if there were any cyclists ahead or, or behind me. So in a nutshell, I guess, for me, it was just in, in the desert in Western Sahara that I had lots of interactions with gendarmerie. In the rest of Morocco, I didn't. Well, it sounds very, very similar area, in fact. And by the time this podcast comes out, you will have heard the previous one that I recorded a, a few days ago with Jenny Tuff, who ran across the Atlas Mountains. And she had a very, very similar, but even more uh, controlling situation where it was, again, men turning up in the middle of the night with no... Um, with no uniforms and no marked vehicles carrying guns telling her she needed to move. So, um, uh, yes, a, a similar experience, but different, uh, a different impact possibly because you were obviously travelling steadily as you were. They could keep a track on you, whereas uh, in her case she was running across uh, unmarked tracks on, on the mountains, so they struggled to keep up with her. So it's another story. But again, you must listen to the podcast and have a listen to that and see what you think. I will. A curious coincidence that Nikki and Jenny Tuff experienced such close attention in the Atlas Mountains. Is it a cultural thing, I wonder, or were there really hidden dangers hiding in the shadows? My thanks to Nikki for taking the time, and in part two we hear how she and other cyclists were welcomed into people's homes, some different types of travellers she met along the way, and how grateful she was to a couch-surfing host after a close call with a taxi in Senegal left her injured and unable to continue on two wheels for a while. All this and more can be read over on her blog, readysteadyslow.wordpress.com. Many listeners have suggested future guests via the newsletter or on my social media and Facebook page, so I do seem to be busy most nights these days. Therefore, your support and help spreading the word about this podcast amongst your social circle is greatly appreciated. Until next time, folks, take care out there and bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear or see more from our extensive free library, please visit theoutdoorsstation.co.uk.